Okay, welcome to uh, the math 1241 Calc 1 fall, uh, I mean fall 2021 review. We are doing the fall uh, 2019 common A final exam. We're going to be going over that. Um, so the front of this page here is going to be, it's going to look a little bit different from what you'll see during your final, um, but standard things, last name, first name, student ID, the instructor, and the section. So make sure that you know these things. Please know your name. Um, you know, it seems like I, should, I shouldn't have to say that, but yes, know your name. Bring your ID. I'll make sure that's pr uh, present as well. Uh, student ID, your instructor, and your section, okay? So let's get started. Part one, okay? Part one of your final exam, you will not have a calculator. You will not have access to your calculator. Um, I'm not too sure about uh, where that calculator will be placed, um, either underneath your seat or up at the front, but you will not have a calculator for this first part. Okay. Now, let's start with this first question, and everyone can see, right? Okay, cool. So, number one, it says let f of x equal 4x to the third power plus 3x minus 2. Uh, evaluate f prime of 1. So essentially, we're going to find the derivative and then evaluate that uh, with, where x equals 1. So I'm, I'm not going to rewrite the function. I'm just gonna, I'm going to find the derivative. And this is a, this is a standard function. Uh, let me draw x squared okay, plus Three. So I found the derivative of our function f of x, 12x squared plus 3. I'm now going to plug or substitute 1 for x. Standard. Pretty simple. I'm going to work it out in a little bit more detail than usual, but uh, I plug in 1 for x. Uh, x 1 squared is 1 times 12. I'm just Reiterating that, so we have 12 plus 3, we get a final answer of 15. So f, no, f prime of 1 is equal to 15. Pretty simple, and that is answer choice E. All right. What's most important is that you choose the correct answer. This For this part, work is not required, so uh, make sure you know you don't want to get the right answer here on the paper and then uh, fill in the wrong uh, multiple choice answer. So just make sure you, you're, you're aware of that. The next problem, another derivative problem. We have f of x equals 10 divided by x squared. It says find f prime of x. So for this problem here, I will rewrite the function uh, simply because it is in a way that uh, doesn't lend itself to, uh, for me to personally to find the derivative very easily. So I'm going to rewrite 10 over x squared. That is the same thing as 10 times x to the negative 2 power. I'm using a little bit of exponent rules or laws or properties, whatever you may call it. After I rewrite that, I'm now going to find my derivative, okay, just using this power rule, uh, negative 2 times 10 is 20, x, uh, I'm going to subtract from it, negative 2 minus 1 will give us negative 3, and I can rewrite that as negative 20 over x to the third power, that is going to be answer choice E. We're done with that one. So as we see the first page, there's a lot of finding derivatives. You should be able to get through this very quickly. Um, I'm going to go on to number three next. So again, it says h of x is equal to the square root of 6x plus 3. Find h prime of 1. Now, again, like the last problem, 
It's written in a way that doesn't lend itself to me easily finding the derivative. So I'm going to rewrite it. Um, the square root of 6x plus 3, or the square root of this whole thing, is the same thing as saying 6x plus 3, the whole thing, to the 1 half power. Now that I have it in a way that more suits finding the derivative, I use my power rule. It's 1 half times 6x plus 3. Now, here's an, here's an instance where we're going to have to utilize the chain rule. We have a function inside a function. The function that's inside is 6x plus 3. So we've already took the derivative of the outside. Of, and let me finish that off. 1 half, going to subtract 1 from that. I've already taken the derivative of the outside. Now the derivative of the inside function, the derivative of 6 x is just going to be 6. And derivative of 3 is 0. Okay. Let's just clean it up now. Um, I can multiply the 6 times the 1 half. Multiplication is commutative. I get 3 times 6x plus 3 to the negative 1 half. That negative is very important. I'm going to rewrite that as uh, 3 over 6x plus 3 to the positive 1 half. And then finally, I can write that as the square root of 6x plus 3. Now, we haven't finished the question. It wants us to find h, h prime of 1. So I'm just being very explicit. This is equal to x plus 3. Square root of 9, 6 times 1 plus 3. It's going to give us 3 <coughs> over 3, which is equal to 1. Okay, you don't have to show this much detail. Um, this is just for review purposes, okay? Now the next problem, number four, same deal, finding the derivative, but now we have an inverse trig function. So you're gonna have to really know your trig functions for this uh, final review. Make sure that you study those. Um, you can get you can get uh, any one. You, you might you see tangent here, but uh, arc, arc, uh, arc tangent, but you can see any one of them. Now I'm gonna. You don't have to do this. Let me just section off. don't have to do this, but oh, let me visual. I'm going to rewrite this as tangent inverse. You don't have to do that. It's just for, you know, just to show you they're both the same thing. They mean the same thing. Now my inverse function, the derivative of tangent, or I mean of inverse tangent or arc tangent will be 1 over 1 plus, right? Usually it's an x value, but uh, the, we're taking our tangent of 2x. This will be our input here, and we're going to square that. Now, we have a function inside of a function. Even though it is uh, a simple function, it's, 2x is still a function uh, that we can take the chain rule of. We can take the derivative of. So 
we're going to use the chain rule here. We did the outside, now we're going to do the inside function, which is 2x. The derivative of 2x is 2. We simplify this whole thing, and that gives us 2 over 1 plus uh, 2 squared, or, well, this is the same thing, 2x squared is the same thing. And remember, the, per the per parentheses matters, 2x squared times 2x squared, which will give us 4x squared. If it was just 2x squared without the parentheses, that is not the same thing, okay? We have 4x squared. And we are done. We see that answer as D. Number five, and the, the, la uh, the last uh, derivative problem on this page, we have g of x is equal to x squared plus 3 times e to the 2x minus 2. Find g prime of 1. So let's go ahead, and I'm not going to rewrite this one because I, can, I like the way it is. I can take the derivative of that. Derivative of 2x, I mean of x squared is 2x plus, now we have 3 uh, times e to the 2x minus 2. Now that 3 is a, a scalar multiple. We can, we can pull that out and we don't have to worry about that. We'll multiply it back in later. But we'll just take the derivative of e to the 2x minus 2. Well, it, that's going to require the chain rule. We have a function inside of a function. Now, e to the x, right? The derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, right? So, whatever that whatever that uh, x value is, it doesn't doesn't change. It's just e to the x is e to the x. Now, let's look at it like this: derivative of e to the let's just say f of x. Let's call it the function. Well, we would have to use the chain rule. The outer stays the same, but we're going to multiply that times f prime of x, that function. So we, use the, we utilize the chain rule here. e to the 2x minus 2, that doesn't change. But we're now going to multiply that times the derivative of 2x minus 2, which is just Two. And we simplify everything. I'm going to get 2x plus, I can multiply the 2 times the 3 to give me 6e to the 2x minus 2. And now I'm going to actually do what the question is asking, and I'm going to plug in, or we're going to substitute 1 everywhere there's an x. So 2 times 1, uh, 2 times 1 minus 2, that's going to leave us with e to the 0. We continue simplifying. 2 plus 6 times anything to the 0 power is just 1. Uh, 2 plus 6 is 8. We are done. Okay, tricky one. Um, remember, remember the chain rule is very important here. Don't let that e to the to the uh, sum function uh, trip you up. Don't let it discourage you. So next, we get into something a little bit different. Um, we are now not just taking the derivative, we're finding the equation of a line, or specifically it says find an equation of the line tangent to the graph of f of x equals 
2x plus 1 squared at the point where x equals 1. So there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can approach this, but I know that I know something. I know that I'm going to need to know the equation for a line. Simply uh, y equals mx plus b, the tangent line. Um, so I put that down just to give myself a little bit of a reminder. Now I could uh, do a couple things. I could either uh, find the derivative first because I'm going to need the slope when x is equal to 1. Um, but I'm also going to need uh, my y value. All right, And I'm going to need to know b. So m, b, and x. I need those things to, to write the equation of a line. And now I'll, I'm going to start with finding y. So f, I know what f of x is equal to as a function, so I'm going to plug 1 in for x and see if I can't find my y. Plus 1. So I get 2 times 1 plus 1. That's going to be 3 squared, which is just 9. So our y value is equal to 9. So we know that, so that we know x and y. One, no, that's our point. One nine. Now, we need to know. We need to find the slope at x equals one. Uh, we're going to use the derivative. Or we're going to find the derivative of that of the function to do that. F of x is equal to two x plus one squared. That's going to involve the chain rule. Two times two plus x plus one. Two minus one is just going to be to the one power. I don't, you don't have to put that, it's, it should be known. And then the derivative of 2x plus 1, multiplying, I'm sorry, that's multiplication, times 2. I can simplify this whole thing out. I get 4x plus 2 times 2, which is equal to 8x plus 4. Now, if I want to find the slope for, at x equals 1, I'm just going to plug one in to this derivative function that I found. Eight times one plus four, 12. Okay, so we have our, we have our y, we have our, uh, we have our slope, and the last thing we need is our b value. Well, I'm gonna substitute y, nine in for y. I'm gonna substitute in my slope and I'm going to substitute in my x value. So I know three of the four variables so I can find the last one. Okay, 9 equals 12 times 1 plus b. Oops. b equals negative 3. So I can now, as I'm writing the equation of the line, I, all I need is y, m, and b. Y, oh, well, actually, I'm sorry. All I need is m <laughs> and b. Y is equal to 12x minus 3. All you need is your m and b. Switching gears again. So we the first page we solved for just derivatives. Then we said we want to find the equation of a tangent line. Now we're testing knowledge of concavity. It says on which interval below is the graph of g of x equal to x times ln of x concave up? Choose the largest interval possible. Well, concavity, I know that I'm going to have to if I'm interested in concavity, and let's just use g instead of you know the sec we want the second derivative. The second derivative. How do we get that? Well, it it's in a it's in a way that's easy for me or simple for me to go. I don't have to, to rewrite that. I'm gonna say g prime of x is equal to and I have two functions, 
x times ln of x. I'm going to have to utilize the product rule. So I'm going to take the derivative of my first, which is 1, times the second. I'm going to leave that alone. And I'm going to add that to, now I'm going to leave the first alone, and I'm going to take the derivative of the second. I clean this up. I get ln of x plus 1. Now, taking the second derivative should be even simpler. I don't have to use the product rule this time. Ln, I'm taking the derivative of this now. Ln of x plus 1. Ln of x plus 1 derivative of 1, 0. I'm done. And now, if we wanted to know where it's concave up, we set it equal to 0 and solve. Well, x cannot, x cannot be uh, equal to 0. That would be undefined. Um, our x value actually has to be greater than 0. I'm still going to draw a number line. Put 0 on there. Now, it, our, well, our x value can be greater than 0 or less than 0. But from the original uh, function, g of x is equal to x times ln of x, uh, we don't, we, we can, we're going to restrict the domain and just say we, we only want to deal with values uh, greater than 0 because that's a logarithm. Uh, we will not input negative values into that original function. So we're gonna, only going to look at the positive values for the derivative. And when, and when I look at these positive values, or I test the value, let's just say um, ln of, you know, ln of, or I'm sorry, 1 over 1. We test the value. We know that's positive. All the values above 0, we know they'll be positive. What does that mean for our concavity? That means that our function is concave up on for all of those values. So uh, a little uh, greater than 0, we are concave up. What is that interval? Well, that is from 0 to infinity. We use the parentheses to denote that uh, 0 is not included and that we know that, and we also know that infinity is unbounded. We only, and for that last problem, I just want to reiterate, we only use the values of x that were greater than zero because of the, the original function. Number eight, it says, where does the graph of f of x equal x to the third power minus 9x squared plus 24x plus 1 have a relative maximum? Okay. We're dealing with relative maximum. Uh, unlike concavity, for this, we just need the first derivative. It's very simple x squared minus 18x plus 24. Now that we know this, well, our maximums and minimums take place when our first derivative is equal to 0. So we're going to actually set this function equal to 0 and solve. I'm going to factor out a 3. I'm going to continue factoring. I'm going to factor this quadratic. Oh, sorry, this should be an 8. Minus 4 times x minus 2 is equal to 0. My values are 
x equals 4 and x equals 2. Those, both of those values would make the function equal to 0, either or. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a number line. And remember, this number line represents f prime of x. I'm going to put negative, I mean, I'm going to put positive 2 and positive 4 in that number line. And then I'm going to put some test values. You don't have a calculator for this part, so you want to, you know, we make it so that the, the test values are very uh, simple to put in. You want to choose some, some, some simple numbers. I'm going to try f prime of 0. If I substitute 0 into this function here, um, that should be a positive number. Okay, 0 times 3, 0 squared times 3 minus 18 times 0. That's going to give us 24, which we know is positive. Now, 3, this, and remember these are tests. We're just testing, okay? And that if we if we can get one value in that interval, we can assume that the rest of the values will also be positive. F prime of three, I plug that in. Um, you might want to work it out by hand, so I'll just do that. F. So we just do three times three squared minus eighteen times three plus twenty-four. That's going to give me. 27 minus 4, three, yep, plus 24. That turns out to be negative. Okay, that turns out to be negative. And then the last one, I'm going to test f prime of 5. I plug that in. Three times five squared minus eighteen times five would be six and two ninety plus twenty four. Let me actually push out my calculator. Trying to do this stuff in my just for review purposes. <laughs> oh, actually, I'm I'm not going to use the calculator. You should be able to. You should be able to do these things in your head, or you should be able to like. We want the. It's not really about knowing the precise answer. It's just about knowing the range. Yeah, the sign. So five squared is uh, twenty-five times seventy-five minus ninety plus twenty-four. Well, we know we know this is positive. Twenty-four plus seventy-five. That's close to a hundred minus ninety. We know this is positive. Now. On this, when f prime of 0 is equal to 0, right, or when x is equal to 2, we see that we go from positive to negative, right, positive to negative. And from when x is equal to 4, we go from negative to positive. So I think of positive to negative as like a frowny face, you were happy, now you're sad. Then I think of negative to positive as like you're happy now, it looks like a smile. Okay, we have, our, we have a maximum at 2, and we have a minimum at 4. What does the question ask us? Where do you have a relative maximum? Well, at x equals 2. You have a relative maximum at x equals 2. And I almost made a mistake. Yeah, you don't have a calculator for this part. You don't need a precise answer for the interval. You just need to know if the sign is negative or positive. We're switching gears from this problem back to finding the derivative and evaluating the function. Uh, so number nine, we're now testing, we te and, and know how to take the derivative of all different types of functions because there will be an assortment of functions. F, prim, f, of, x, let f of x equal ln of x times 2x minus 1 to the third power. Now, start off with this. This is going to involve the chain rule, the derivative, so we're going to take the, the derivative of the outside function, derivative of ln of whatever is going to be 1 
over whatever that thing is. So x times 2x minus 1 to the third power. But we can't forget what was inside. We have x times 2x minus 1 to the third power. So we have, so let me just section this off. Now we're going to take the derivative of x times 2x minus 1 to the third power. Well, that's going to involve the product rule. We're going to take the derivative of the first function, which is 1. Put it inside this. So 1 times, we're going to leave 2x minus 1 to the third power alone. Then we're going to add, we're going to leave x alone. And we're going to take the derivative of 2x minus 1 to the third power. Well, that bad boy actually involves the chain rule as well. There's a, a function inside of that function as well. On the outside, we get 3 times 2x minus 1 to the second power. The derivative of 2x minus 1 will be 2. So we took the derivative, we used, we utilized the chain rule there. We had to use the chain rule, and then we used the product rule, and then we used the chain rule inside of that product rule. It can get a little confusing sometimes, so make sure you take your time, and sometimes it's good to write it out. Oh, I need the chain rule, I need the product rule, I need the chain rule. I'm gonna simplify everything so that I can easy, more easily put it into the function and I get 2x minus 1 to the third power plus x times 3 times 2 will give me 6x, 2x minus 1 squared. Okay. And if at this point you feel comfortable substituting or plugging in, you can do that right there. Now, I, I suggest that, uh, I suggest that you plug in um, right here because you could make a mistake trying to simplify it when you actually got the answer. So I, I suggest plugging in if, if you feel comfortable there. If not, you can further simplify it. Um, I'm just gonna simplify it one more time myself. X over two X minus one, third power, X minus one to the third power plus six. Okay, and, I, and I'm just gonna plug in here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to do anything too complex with my algebra because I don't wanna make a mistake. This isn't about showing your work. So f prime of x is equal to this whole thing. We don't have to clean it up. I'm just trying to evaluate it. So two times one minus one, third power plus six times one, times two, times one. Everywhere I put the one is where I substituted. Okay, this should be fairly simple. Okay, two, my, two times one minus one, that's going to be one to the third plus six times one, six, two times one minus one, one to the second, all over one times two times one minus one to the third power. That just leaves us with one to the third. So 1 plus 6 over 1, 7 over 1, which is just 7. You can try to, you can go ahead and simplify it further, but that will, like I said, you don't want to make a mistake trying to simplify it and it messes up your final answer. So once you get it, once you get to a comfortable point where you can plug in, just go from there. Just, just 
just note it, and I'll come back to it. Okay? All right. Now, the, we're now switching to a limits problem. Uh, it says evaluate the limit x as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 3x minus 10 over x minus 2. We have... So we can do a couple things. The first thing that you should do um, is, is direct substitute. You should, just, you should just plug in, all right? We know, I know that it's not going to work, but I'm still going to do it, okay? Just to be sure. You never know. So to evaluate this limit, I'm going to plug in 2 for x, and I get a uh, 4 plus 6 minus 10 over 2 minus 2, which is just 0 over 0. Oh, man. Well, I knew that. But this, this lets me know that um, it, it's, it's not that it doesn't exist. It's just I have to approach it differently. Now, the limit as x approaches 2, I'm going to take, I'm going to show you two different approaches. Now, this on the top, and remember, look how I'm, I'm, right, I'm continuously writing my limit unless I'm evaluating it. So limit as x approaches 2, the top can be factored into x minus 2 times x plus 5. Well, look at this. x minus 2 and x minus 2 is in the denominator and the numerator. Those can be canceled. So we're left with the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 5. Now, oh, now I can evaluate that. 2 plus 5, 7. Done. Okay? That can be seen as uh, the long way, um, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty, pretty quick. There's another, another way. Well, we know we learned something called L'Hopital's rule. We learn L'Hopital's rule. And so if we have this limit, as x approaches to 3x minus 10, all right? Now, if the top and bottom are differentiable, uh, we can actually say that the limit as x approaches 2, let's take the derivative of the top, 2x plus 3. The derivative of the bottom is just going to be 1. The derivative of x is 1, and then the derivative of negative 2 is just 0. We're left with the limit as x approaches 2 of 2x plus 3 over 1. Well, let's just substitute 2 in now. 2 times 2 plus 3. That's going to be equal to 7. 7 over 1. 7 over 1 is just going to be equal to 7. So L'Hopital's rule can be very quick as well. You could have went either direction. But you have to, you have to know the top, uh, the top and the bottom have to both be differentiable. Just want to note too, L'Hopital's rule also applies to left and right sided limits or one sided limits. Okay? Last three questions. <coughs> so another limit, another limit question. It says evaluate the limit as x approaches infinity of 4 minus x squared over x squared plus 2x plus 4. Okay. Now, uh, you have two different approaches that you could take. I'm going to do L'Hopital's rule because that's fresh on our mind. Uh, the top and the bottom are both differentiable. L'Hopital's
I'm just going to use the LH for short. So the limit as x approaches infinity of 4x squared over x squared minus 2x plus 4 is going to be the same as the limit as x approaches infinity of negative 2x over 2x plus 2. All right? Now, where I messed up at the beginning is I didn't substitute infinity in. But if I, if I substitute infinity in uh, for this function, I'm just going to get negative infinity over infinity. That's what we call indeterminate. Okay? So if I substitute it into the first one, I would have gotten that. Now this second one, if I substitute if I substitute infinity in for x as well, I'm still going to get negative infinity over infinity. It's indeterminate. We don't know what that value could be. Could be anything. Now we're going to take we're going to do L'Hopital's rule again. The limit. And notice how I keep carrying my limit. The limit as of derivative. We're going to take the derivative of the top negative 2 the, over the derivative of the bottom, over 2. Now, we have just negative 2 over 2. There are, There is no x variable, right? There's nothing to substitute x into. But the limit as x, we can now say the limit as x approaches infinity is equal to this, of this simplified value here, or this constant value. Negative 2 over 2 is 1. Our limit will be equal. Limit as x approaches infinity of this function will be negative 1. Okay. That's one approach. L'Hopital, pretty quick. I, I would say it's the go-to. But the, the top function and the bottom function must both be differentiable and continuous. Uh, well, just differentiable. Now, if you could take it another route. I could have divided by the highest x power in the denominator. That's another approach that you will see. I could have said the limit as x approaches infinity. And I'm going to divide every single term by x squared. every single term by x squared. Simplify that. Four over x squared minus one over one plus two over x plus four over x squared. And why does that work well? Because if we now substitute in infinity for x, it, as you as your number gets bigger and bigger in the denominator, right, we can assume that number approaches zero. So four divided by infinity, we're going to say that's zero. So zero minus one over one plus, right? 2 divided by infinity will give us 0. 4 divided by infinity squared will give us 0. So we end up with negative 1 over 1, which gives us the same conclusion as L'Hopital's. It's just a matter of preference. It's not a, it's not a, a you have to do one or the other. We're just looking for the um, right answer. Now, for number 12, we shift gears, and it says let y equals 2x divided by 2x minus 3. Evaluate the differential dy when x is equal to 2 and dx is equal to 0 0.2. Now, you may you be like, where, where do I start here? Well, this is where symbolism comes into play. D, dx, okay? 
This is not, uh, I'm gonna use a little bit of abusive notation, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna take the derivative of this entire thing, the left and right side. I'm taking the derivative with respect to x of y, so dy dx, and I'm also taking the derivative with respect to x of the other side, being very explicit. Okay. Now, dy dx, now the derivative with respect to x of this, we're just going to take the derivative as normal. Uh, we need the quotient rule here. So we're going to use the quotient rule. I think it's best suited for this to take the derivative of this. So the first thing I'm going to say is that my denominator squared, okay, I have a function divided by another function, my denominator squared, I'm going to take the derivative of the top, which is 2x, take the derivative of that, and multiply it times my denominator. I'm not going to take the derivative of the denominator just yet. Now, unlike product rule, we have subtraction going on here. Now I'm going to take this, uh, the, 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 the numerator, and I'm not going to take the derivative of that. I'm actually going to take the derivative of the denominator and multiply that. So 2x times 2. Let me clean that up. dx dy is equal to 4x minus 6 minus 4x all over 2x minus 3 squared. I'm not going to uh, foil anything out or distribute anything in the denominator just yet. I'm just going to see, I'm going to see what I can do without doing that. dy dx is equal to negative 6 over 2x minus 3 squared. And so we're trying to evaluate dy. We're trying to find dy. I'm going to multiply dx on both sides so that I can get rid of this dx. Bam, bam. So I end up with dy is equal to negative 6 over 2x minus 3 over 2 times dx. So now, we know what x is and we know what dx is. I'm just going to substitute. I'm, not, I'm glad I didn't foil anything out. So 2 times 2 minus 3 squared times 0 0.2. dy is equal to negative 6. Uh, 2 times 2 is 4. Minus 3 is 1. This is just going to end up being 1 squared times 0 0.2. dy is equal to negative 1 squared is just 1 times 0 0.2. That is going to give us negative 1.2. Please be careful with your signs because this, you know, the answer choice 1.2 is also available. You don't want to make, just be careful. Make sure you go through, double check your signs. Last problem in the non-calculator part is we're finding the antiderivative. Um, we have g of x is equal to 6 divided by x to the third plus 2 times cosine of x. I'm going to rewrite this so that it's easier for me to take the antiderivative or find the antiderivative. And then I'm also going to say, you know, this is, this is not a standard, but this is what I do. Um, g of x, because, it's, because it can be confusing sometimes to go work backwards, I'm going to say g of x is equal to, and I'm just going to use a big G, g prime of x. So some function with a big G, uh, it, uh, you take the derivative of that, they're, they're both the same thing. So what I'm trying to find is I'm trying to find just regular G, big G of X. I'm just trying to find regular big G of X. And we're going to work 
a little bit backwards. So our original function, we usually take the power rule, we multiply in the front, and we subtract. This time, we are going to add 1, and we are going to divide by that exponent that we get, or what we've added to our initial exponent. Okay. So we're going to add, and then we're going to divide by whatever this uh, result is. Also, we know that the derivative, if we want to work backwards, we know that the derivative of sine of x is equal to cosine of x. So your signs are very important when it comes to sine and cosine, of course. Um, the, the signs are very important. You don't want to mistake them. So I, I wrote it out. So if I want to work in reverse, the derivative, um, well, the antiderivative of cosine of x is just sine. Oh, and I forgot something here, my 2. My 2 is a scalar. We can pull it out. It, it's not a part of the derivative. Uh, we, can, uh, we can take it out. It's just it scales the derivative up. We don't, we don't do anything with that. And then we add a constant, all right, some constant. So generally, with your antiderivatives, you should, have it, you should always have that plus c at the end. Uh, we, I worked this out x to the negative 4 over negative 4. Oh, oh, negative, I'm sorry, negative 3 plus 1. Common mistake that's made. Negative 3 plus 1 is not more negative. So that should be a 2. Quick mistake, easy mistake to make. It's 2 sine, especially when you're rushing. And the answer choice that it most looks resembles is answer choice E. Okay, D and E look very similar, but don't get confused by that X in front of the sign. Like there's there's there should not be an X in front of that in front of that sign. Okay, we have fin we have concluded the calculator inactive portion um, probably it take it takes a lot longer than the calculator active portion because sometimes you have to do um, the calculations in your head so this next section should not take as long now the calculator active section I go ahead I'm gonna bust out my calculator I have it to the side just so that I can go through the problems much faster. All right. All right. So it says. Suppose that f, our first, our first question, it says that suppose that f is continuous function defined on the interval 0 to 3 and that f of 0 is equal to negative 1, f of 1 is equal to negative 2, f of 2 is equal to 2, and f of 3 is equal to 1. Then according to the intermediate value theorem, which of the following must be true? Now, uh, in order to... Well, I'm just going to write out the intermediate value theorem. Uh, so if a function, uh, let's call it y equals f of x, is continuous, on a closed interval, A comma B, then f of x takes on every value between f of A and f of B 
on that interval. So just, sim just simply, you know, if it's continuous, then the function should have a value on that entire interval. Now, um, some necessary things. Necessary things to apply the intermediate value theorem. So um, I'll just give you three things, right? We know f is continuous. F is continuous on a comma b, this closed interval. F of a should not equal f of b. And number three, f of c uh, is between some c, where x is some c between f of a and f of b. So it's not necessarily that you remember this stuff verbatim, but it's good stuff to know. And I try to, I try to knock things down. When it, when it comes to my theorems and calculus, I try to knock it down to like bullet points, like of three, like three or two things, or like I try to, most of them like three things that I try to remember that helps me remember uh, the theorem in general. Now we know that f of zero is equal to negative one. That's the beginning of the interval. We have the point zero, one. I'm gonna build out this function. So I'm gonna build this function out. So our first point is 0, 1, or 0, negative 1, which is here, negative 1, 0, negative 1. Our next point is 1, negative 2, which is around here. Our next point is f of 2, is 2, comma 2. And then the last point is three comma one. So it says, what of these following statements may be, must be true? F of zero may not have any solutions. Well, if I just drew, if I drew a sketch, right? In order to get from this point here, if we're using it, if the function is continuous, we have, we have to cross through the x-axis, so f of x does have a solution, okay? We're not, so we're gonna rule that, we're gonna rule a out. So none of the above, oh, that's not ruled out yet. Um, it has exactly one solution. Well, uh, we don't know, we don't know that yet. Um, let's just keep going. Uh, so I could continue my function and go directly to this. To, to that next point. But I also could do another thing. It's continuous, so I could start from this function and I can actually go back and cross back through and then go back to that point. So there are multiple possible functions, right? It doesn't have to have exactly one solution, all right? We know that it has at least one solution. So uh, we look at C, it says at least one solution, but may not have two solutions. Well, let's look at, let's look at uh, D. D says at f of zero must have at least two solutions. Well, what we'll see from this particular uh, function is that it will have, it will have an odd amount of solutions for x of f of x equals zero, all right? So it, when it crosses through, right? So it went through one, two, three times. If I was to draw another polynomial that, cr if I was to cross it through again, we would see that it, it would have to cross and then come back through. So it would be five, seven. So this does not have at least two solutions because it can only have one. But C is the, per is the perfect answer in this choice. The wording is a little bit weird, but it says f of x equals zero has at least one solution, but may not have two, 
right? It's a little weird. It does not have to, or it should not have to. The solutions will be multiples, or will be odd. It will not be multiples of two. This next problem, we're dealing with linear, uh, linear approximation, not linearization, okay? And so when I'm approximating linearly, it's good to just, for this one, just know this formula. You don't want to have to rack through your brain to kind of go through the concept and figure this formula out, okay? And just and, and work it out. You're gonna. This is one of the. This is one of the key formulas. I would say you should know. All right. So we want to find L of x. What what the equation is for that? Well, we need a couple things. We need f of a. We need f prime of a, and we need to know uh, what a is. Well, it gives us a. A is zero. That's that's great. <coughs> now we can easily find f of a. Right? f of a is just going to be f of 0, which is going to be equal to 1 plus 2 times 0 plus ln of 0 plus 1. That's 1 plus 0 plus ln of 1. Well, ln of 1 is 0, so we end up with 0 plus 0 f of 0 is equal to 1. We also need f prime of a, but in order to have f prime of a, we need to know what f prime of x is equal to. So I'm going to take the derivative of this. Derivative of 1 is uh, it's going to be 0. Derivative of 2x, 2, plus the derivative of ln, uh, x, ln of x plus 1. Well, that's going to be 1 over x plus 1. And we, you know, we don't have to do the chain rule in this instance. Well, we will do the chain rule. The, the derivative of x is just 1. So we just, you know, you can just skip that. Okay. Uh, I'll put it here, though. Derivative of x is 1, so 1 times anything is itself. We now can just substitute in 0 for x, remember because we're trying to find f prime of a. 2 plus 1 over 0 plus 1 equals 2 plus 1 over 1, which is just 3. 2 plus 1 over 1 is 3. Okay, so we have f prime of a, we have a, and we have f of a. We're just going to take our linearization equation and substitute everything. So f of a is equal to 1 plus f prime of a, which is 3, times x minus a is 0. So 1 plus 3 times x, right? 0, x minus 0 is just x, and we have our solution. Now, they just wrote it a little bit differently, but same thing. Same thing. 1 plus 3x is the same thing as 3x plus 1. So this, this is a key, key, key equation or formula to know. All right. The next problem, to, to save a little bit of time, I am going to do it the short way. Now, there's a long way that you could do. You can go ahead and you can say, all right, I have, it wants me to evaluate the limit as, x, as h approaches 0 of f of 2h minus f of 2 over h, I can go ahead and substitute my function in and evaluate everything. But what this is testing is cons your conceptual knowledge, right? You're dealing with the definition of the derivative here, right? So you have to recognize that. The definition of the derivative, okay? So f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h 
minus f of x all over h. Okay, that's what we're looking at over here. We have we we we're looking at we're looking at this over here. Well, let's apply it. We're going to say that f prime of two is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of f of two plus h minus f of two all over h. So what is f of x equal to? Well, f of x is equal to e to the 2x. What is f prime of x equal to? So you're just, you're simply going to take, you're going to evaluate the functions derivative at 2. f prime of x of e to the x is 2 times e to the 2x. We're going to plug in 2. Here we go. Now, the key is recognizing what your function is and recognizing what you're trying to plug into the function. It's good to know the definition of derivative. I could have went a long way and then plugged everything directly into this function here. And I mean, I could use this function to build out my to build out my limit and then uh, evaluated that, but it's a lot faster to know the derivative and then to pick out the key features and, and correlate that to the function. So if, this, if any of this seems like uh, you don't remember it, make sure you go to study that. Okay. Number four. Number four is a little bit of, it's a little bit, uh, I would say a little bit trig algebra, not just we, we threw this in there. This is, uh, I will not be using derivatives to do this one. I don't want to say it's non-calculus. It's calculus related, but you don't necessarily need to do it, find the derivatives or anything like that. So a function that's one to one, uh, in other words, injective function, right, uh, essentially it passes the horizontal line test. Every input and output is one to one. You do not have duplicate uh, inputs for every output, okay? You don't, you cannot, you cannot have two, and I'll, and I'll show you an example. So the first function, sine of x, And, I'm just, and these are just sketches. You can use your calculator at this point. If you don't remember how sine of x looks, you can go ahead and put it into the y equals and graph it. So my calculator was in uh, degree mode, which made my graph look a little funky. So I had to go to I had to go to my mode and change it from degrees to radians. Um, but we know how the you should know how the sine function looks at this time. Just a rough sketch. Okay. Now it's only it's saying is it is this one-to-one? -one? Well, when we look at this, this doesn't pass the horizontal line test. If I draw a straight line through, I'm gonna get two value, I'm gonna get two, it's gonna cross through multiple values, or of the same values. Multiple values for x have the same y. It's a, a periodic function. So it, you know, it repeats in it over and over. Now, it's asking on an interval from negative 
pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So actually, it's only asking about the domain in this interval. Now, the domain in this interval is 1 to 1. It is 1 to 1. There is no repetition from this point to this point for our, for our, our y values. So this is yes in that interval. Not the function overall, but in that interval. Another function that we have, we have e to the x. Okay? If I draw e to the x, it's asking from negative infinity to infinity. Okay? I can't represent that on paper, but I'm just going to do a rough sketch. It's asking, does the y repeat? If I say 1 to 1, does the y repeat in this interval? No. So yes, this function is 1 to 1. And then lastly, we have, these are just some functions that you should know. We have x squared. These are standard functions. e to the x, sine of x. Um, just, it's just a sketch, not, not perfect. But it's asking, is this 1 to 1? Well, the y repeats. If I drew a horizontal line test, I would get two different values or across two different parts. Right? But it's asking from 0 to infinity. So from 0 from zero to infinity, this function is 1 to 1. So yes, these are all, so 1, 2, and 3 are injective or 1 to 1 functions on these domains. So you have to know a little bit about domains. Not really calculus per se, but important to know for calculus. Back, back to um, something that we, you know, I like personally. Um, the second derivative of a function, f is given by, and it gives us the derivative, the second derivative function. Which of the following statements is correct? Now, for the second derivative, we know that f of x, where it equals 0, we have an inflection point. Where f double prime of x is greater than 0, we have concave up. Right? Our original function would be concave up there. And for f prime of x less than 0, it's concave down. So what I, what I want to do here, well, I know my x values are my critical points. So x equals 1 is a critical point, x equals 2 is a critical point, and x equals 3 is a critical point. Find 1, 2, and 3. Right? And it's asking me uh, some questions. Does f have a relative max at 1? Um, does f have an inflection point at x equals 2? Is f concave down on interval 2 to 3? And f has an inflection point at x equals 3. So I drew my number line. And what's great about this is I don't have to calculate this in my head. You can. But I'm going to plug this function into my calculator. graph it. Oh. Sorry. Okay. And I'm going to pick, so I'm going to go second calc. And now I can enter values for x for this function. And remember, this represents f double prime of x. Uh, e, so 0, less than 1, my first test value. I don't care about the actual value specifically. I just care if it's negative or positive. So we're positive on that side. I'll go to calculate my next one, 1.5. This just makes it a little bit easier because we're dealing with decimals. 
this is going to be negative. Second calc, go again, 2.5. This is positive. And then on second calc, let's just say I can do four. That's also going to be positive. So what we see here is we see on this first interval here, um, our regular function would be concave up. Uh, then we have a, a switch in concavity from concave up to concave down. Then we have a switch to concave up, and it remains that way. Now, which question, which of the following statements is correct? Well, uh, it has an inflection point at x equals 3. That is not true. Okay? That is not true. It's concave down on the interval from 2 to 3. This is concave up. This is concave up. That is not true. It says f has an inflection point at x equals 2. Wow. Yes, we do. Because we see that our concavity changes from down to up. So yes, B would be the correct response. All right, and then for one, it says we have a relative max. Well, our original function goes from concave up to, to concave down at one, right? So. It goes from concave up to concave down. That isn't a maximum or minimum. That's an inflection point. We can rule one. We can rule that one out as well. But we've already found our answer. That's not a maximum. That's that's another inflection point. A change of concavity. Concavity. Okay. Question six. Question six. We have f of x, we go back to our functions. It says, let f of x equals e to the 2x plus 1. Then f inverse, or uh, yeah, f inverse of x, the inverse of f of x is equal to. So for this problem, uh, you, would pro you would possibly think that uh, you need to do some calculus, right? But it's not asking for the derivative of the inverse function. It's just asking for the derivative. Um, I mean, the, the inverse. It's just asking for the inverse, sorry. It's not asking for the derivative of the inverse, just, just the inverse. So this formula that we, you know, you might, it, I would say, hey, be prepared to know this, or be prepared to do a problem like this, derivative of f of x equals 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. And I always have to write this one out myself personally because just because I the 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 uh, the symbol here and the one they just they mess with my brain a little bit so I always have to write it out and I substitute in. So make sure that you do know this, but it's it's not needed. Not needed right now. Not at this moment. What we do know, though, is that f of x is equal to e to the 2x plus 1. Um, I'm going to say that f of x is y. It's our output. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap our x and y's, or invert them. x is equal to e to the 2y plus 1. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides, I get x minus 1 is equal to e to the 2y. Okay. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. You know what? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, then I'm going to take the natural log of both sides because I want to get rid of that e. This is going to be natural log of x minus 1 equals 2y. I'm going to divide both sides by 2. I'm going to end up with y equals ln 
of x minus 1 divided by 2, which is the same thing as multiplying by 1 half. Multiplying by 1 half and dividing by 2 are the, th the same thing. I get answer choice D. Now, if you go ahead and at this step here, um, if you don't, if you, if I, I made a mistake in, in my work because I wrote it like this earlier, you will get a different result. You will get a different result. So just be careful how you write it. Also, at this point here, um, you know, we, we have what would be considered the inverse function, but we want that inverse function in terms of x. So what we're doing from this point on, right, once you swap x and y, what you're doing from that point on is you're just solving for y in terms of x. Okay, the rest of this is just solving where you want y equals something with x in it. Now question number seven, again, it says suppose that f of x is equal to this, all, we see all these pieces, four pieces where f is this, and it says where is f discontinuous? Well, not really too much calculus here, or any calculus here, you just have to graph the function. So negative 2, negative 1, 1, 2, I see those. I'm just going to make a fairly simple graph, negative 1. So this first statement says that uh, our function f of x is equal to negative 1 for all the x values less than 0. So any value that's less than zero, that means in this direction here, this would be our first one. That's our first piece. The next part of the function picks up, it says x minus one is equal to, uh, or f of x is equal to x minus one uh, for zero is less than x, which is less than one. Now, you could try to put this bad boy in the calculator um, as a piecewise function, but that would take a very long time. Uh, I would just put the individual pieces in just to give you an idea. I know that when x is equal to zero, this function is equal to negative one, so it starts here and it goes here, right? When x is equal to one, we get the point, we get the point uh, one zero, our y value is one because one minus one is equal to zero. And I, could, and I could graph it to give me an idea. The next piece of the piecewise function, 2x minus one, right? Uh, the slope is gonna be a little bit different and our, different, our outputs will be different for this function than it would for the last one. But this one picks up at one, between one and two. It's not gonna be, so, at x equals 1, if we plug that in, 2 times 1 is 2 minus 1. So we get the value of 1. But again, it's a, uh, less, it's a uh, less than symbol here. So there's, there's no r equal to. It's not going to have a value there. All of our points are going to be between uh, 1 and 2. We're not going to be equal at that point. And right there, we see discontinuity. We see discontinuity right here. It's very clear and transparent. Now, the last uh, function, x squared, uh, when x is equal to 2, it says x is greater than or equal to 2 on this for this part of the function. So if we plugged in 2, 2 squared minus one, that would be equal to three, right? This value, it will pick up from right here. Okay? And like, I, I didn't say it this time, but if I said two times two minus one, that's equal to three. So the end point of this function, this goes from, this goes from one to three. Our y values go from one to three. 
y equals 3. But, we can, but we're not equal to those things. All of the, the values are in between that interval. And then x squared picks up from where it left, so, left off, and it continues like that. We only have this continuity at x equals 1. We only have this continuity at x equals 1. You could, you could plug your functions into your calculator and check the values, or you can do just quick endpoint plugins and sketch it out. Okay. Again, we have a different type of problem. It says a particle moves vertically, its height above the ground at time t is given by h of t is equal to 10t minus 3t squared plus t to the third for t greater than zero, because time has to be positive, where t is measured in seconds and h is measured in feet. What is the acceleration when t equals three? Well, we know the height function. And we know the t has to be greater than equal to zero. Next, if we want to get the uh, acceler uh, time as a function, or we want to get the acceleration as a function of time, uh, we're first going to start here. The velocity is going to be h prime. We're going to get ten, we're going to take the derivative of h of t. Write that 10 minus 6t plus 3t squared. Still on that same t is greater than or equal to 0. And the last, the second derivative is our acceleration. Negative 6 plus 6t. Same thing, t is greater than or equal to 0. Now, all we have to do, we want to find the acceleration when t is equal to 3. Well, we have acceleration as a function of time. Negative 6 plus 6 times 3. Negative 6 plus 18. Uh, positive 12. And we are in feet per second squared. Our acceleration was the second derivative of the height. And we just plug time into our function. Okay. All right. We're get we're getting we're getting close to the end. We're like, I want to say we're we're good. We're like 60 to 70 percent in. We're we're getting very close to the end. Um, it's going to, the problems are going to get just a little bit more challenging, in my opinion. Okay? But it's not anything that you have not done before. Um, it says, suppose that 3x squared times y squared plus 2x minus 4y is equal to 1. Find the derivative dy, dy, dy dx at the point 1, 1. This function here, I'm going to do like I did in the previous problem. I'm going to put my derivative notation out in front here. A little abusive. Now we're not, dis this doesn't get distributed. Like I'm not saying, I'm not distributing it um, in multi, like d, dx times uh, 3x squared uh, times y squared. I'm, I'm, apl I'm applying it to the left and right hand side. Okay. So this first one, I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. We can think of that three. Remember, it's a scalar, and we can pull it out. It doesn't. It just scales up the value of the function. It doesn't. It's not a part of us finding that function, that derivative function. Now, the derivative of x squared times y squared. Okay. Remember, y. We can see that. 
y is a function of x. We can think of it like that. So it's its, it's, its own function of x. We can think of it like that. And so if we are taking the derivative of two functions that are multiplied by each other, we have to use the product rule. Now the derivative with respect to x of x squared is fairly simple. We get 2x, and we don't do anything to the y squared. 2x times y squared, because remember, y squared is our second function. Plus, now we have, we're going to leave the x squared alone, and we're going to take the derivative with respect to x of y squared. Well, there, this y squared, we're going to have to apply the chain rule. We're going to have to take the derivative of the outer and the inner function. So we have 2y, we're going to multiply that times 2y times dy dx. That represents the derivative of our inner function, which is just y. Y is being squared on the outside. We took the derivative of that and we multiplied it. We're done here. Okay. Plus, now we're going to take the derivative. We're going to take the derivative, and I'm not just multiplying it. I'm actually taking the derivative of each of these parts. The derivative of 2x is just 2. Then I'm going to take the derivative of 4y. Well, 4 is just the scalar. It's going to be multiplied times whatever result I get. d times well, the derivative of y is it's just going to be dy. With respect to x, it's going to be dy dx. And then the derivative of 1 is going to be equal to 0. I can clean this up. 6. And the reason I pulled this 3 out earlier is because sometimes it gets lost in the product rule. So I pulled it out so that I could put it back in properly later. 2x dy dx plus 2 minus 4 dy dx. And all of that equals 0. That's working out nicely for us. Now what I want to do is I want to find dy dx at the point 1 comma 1. So I have to isolate dy dx. Well, every term that does not have dy dx, I'm going to put it on the other side. And I'm going to need a little bit of space. I'm going to hijack some space from these other problems. So over here, I'm going to start. I'm going to say, I'm going to subtract this. And so 2y, 2x squared times y dy dx. All right. I'm also going to subtract this non d this non term onto the other side as well. So minus four dy dx is going to be equal to. Uh, and I kind of kind of shorted myself on space. Uh, da -da -da -da. So 2x squared dy dx minus 4 dy dx equals negative 6y squared minus 2. All right. Now, I want to pull, I can pull the dy dx out of both of these terms. They both share dy dx. I'm left with 2x squared y minus 4 is equal to negative 6xy squared minus 2. Now, I can just divide both sides by this whole term here, 2x squared y minus 4. And that's going to leave me with dy dx is equal to negative 6xy squared minus 2 over 2x squared y minus 4. Almost done. This one is a kind of a doozy. Okay. dy dx is equal to, I'm just going to substitute in my x and y values. x and y are both equal to 1 times 1. This is a very important that you just, you, I would say write out your steps 
just because if you if you go wrong somewhere, it's kind of hard to backtrack. And as you get towards the end of the test, everybody gets fatigued, okay? I don't care who you are, you're gonna get fatigued. It's good to just make sure that you have something to go and backtrack. Mm -hmm. dy dx is equal to negative 6 times 1 times 1 squared, negative 6 minus 2, over 2. Uh, so 2 times 1 squared is 2 times 1, 2 minus 4. I'm left with negative 8. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So I messed up here, even though I didn't distribute my three properly. So this should be six, that should be six. And so that would make this a six. That would make this a six. This would make that a six, six here. And so I would end up with six minus four, which is two, which will give us negative four. I wouldn't have caught that. I wouldn't have caught that unless I've done it before. If somebody didn't say it, um, so just make sure that you go through. And in a problem like this, you definitely go back and check your work. Anything where you did a lot of work in that problem, I would go back and just check your signs, check your distribution. Like those simple things kind of uh, get people messed up. Like you know how to do it. It's just a matter of checking. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go through number 10, let me go to number 10. I'm just not going to take long to kind of explain it. Now, number 10, uh, it says f of x is equal to x squared, I mean x minus 2 times e times k to the x for some positive constant k. This function has a critical number at x equals 3. Find the value of k and determine if x equals 3 gives a relative max, min, or neither. So for this problem, I want to know if f prime of x equals 0. And when, for my x values, do I have max or min or neither? Well, my original function is here. My original function is f of x equals x minus 2 times e to the k to the x. Now, if I want to take the derivative of this, uh, it's a function times a function, can be a little bit uh, complex. What I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify this. I'm going to distribute. I'm going to get x times e to the k to the x minus 2 times e to the k to the x. All right, I just I just distributed the and just to simplify. Now I'm going to take the derivative of this. Well, if I take the derivative of this first part, x is considered is considered a function. I'm going to have to use the product rule. It's not a constant. It's a it's a it's considered a function. So the derivative of x is one times e to the k to the x plus x times, now I'm going to take the derivative of the second part, e to the k to the x, that's just going to be k times e to the k to the x. Now the second part is not, it's not a um, product of two functions, it's just 2 is my scalar times e to the k to the x. Well, the derivative of e to the k to the x will be k to the e to the k to the x. All right, I cleaned this one up. f prime of x equals e to the k to the x plus x we can say xk 
e to the k to the x minus 2k e to the k to the x. What you end up being able to do here is pull out an e to the k to the x. You're left with 1 plus xk minus 2k. Right? So this is so what I'm trying to what I'm trying to find is a value that uh, where my derivative is equal to zero and is is that a max or min? This one is this one is kind of this one, this one is very tricky. This one is very tricky. Um, now they told me the function has a critical number at three, and we want to determine if x equals three gives a max, a min, or neither. Where well. We have to find out, we have too many variables here. We have x and k. Uh, let me go ahead and substitute in. I know what, I know what three, I know, I know what x is equal to when our function is equal to zero. So I'm gonna substitute three in for x, one plus three k minus two k. So this whole thing here, is equal to zero. Well, e, I'm going to simplify it, one plus k equals zero. Well, e to the three k cannot be equal to zero. So one plus k, like e to the three k must be greater than zero. There is nothing, uh, there is no power that you can raise e to to give you zero. So 1 plus k equals 0. k is equal to negative 1. OK, we, found, we know what, when at our critical point of x equals 3, we know what um, k is equal to. So let me just, I'm going to rewrite this one last time. But this time, I'm going to rewrite it with k as our known value instead of x. So I get e to the negative x times 1, uh, one plus, uh, I'm sorry, minus x, 1 minus x. I'm substituting in negative 1 for k plus 2, which is e to the negative x times 3 minus 1. And I want to see at x equals 0, do I have a maximum or minimum? So I draw a number line at x equals 3. And I'm going to, instead of trying to calculate that in my head, I'm going to put that into my calculator. e to the negative x times 3 minus x. I graph it, but I don't want to just trust the graph. I'm gonna plus. I'm gonna plug in some test values. So I'm gonna plug in a test value of zero. <laughs> the original plate equation. So. At so. My derivative, will tell me that. Now on, the, now, on the other side, I'm going to use the test, I'm going to use the test value of 4. That gives me a negative value. Whew, I finally got to the end. Now I know my function is increasing to decreasing. I have a relative maximum. But here's the thing. It says k equals 1. It doesn't say x. All right? Our value of k, we know it's negative 1. Not only do we, we know that k is negative 1, well, at that critical point x equals 3, we have a relative maximum. Um, 
So what I'll do, I'll make sure question number 10 is put up explicitly uh, like on its own with a clear step-by-step -step, like procedure of the solution, okay? So for question number 10, I'll make sure that is put up, okay? Oh, yeah, so um, is, I'll say, uh, not sure. <laughs> Not sure, and we'll and we'll come back and we'll come back to it. Like it will be you. You have the solution posted. Okay. So, so for number ten, just star that. Just know you have to come back to it. I'll make sure that that's up today. Okay. Now for number eleven, we have Newton's method. For number eleven, we have Newton's method. It says use. Uh, x, it says use, uh, we wish to solve x to the third plus 5x plus equals 4 using Newton's method. Use x1 equals 1 as your initial approximation and find x2. The next approximation, you, will, you, are not ask, you are not being asked for the exact solution. Round your answer to two decimal places. So we know you have to know this formula slash setup. You have to know this formula slash setup. So x to the n plus 1 is equal to x to xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. Don't get them confused. The f prime is going to be on the bottom. Well, x2 is equal to x1 minus f of 1 over f prime of 1. Now, in order to find f uh, prime of f of 1, we're going to say x plus 3 plus 5x minus 4. So I took this here and I set it equal to 0. And I called, I called that our function. f of 1 is equal to 1 to the third plus 5 times 1 minus 1, which is equal to 1 plus 5 minus 4, which is equal to 2. f prime of x is equal to 3x squared plus 5. And when we plug in 1 for this, we get 8. So if I could proceed, I know that x1 is equal to 1. 1 minus 2 over 8. Uh, we don't really need the calculator for this. 1 minus 1 fourth. That's the same thing as 3 over 4 or 0 0.75. 0 0.75. Next, this is the last uh, calculator active section problem. And then the, the short answer problems are surprisingly quicker. They're surprisingly quicker. So for this one here, it says suppose that f prime of x is equal to this and that f, one, f of 1 is equal to 3. Find a formula f of x and then evaluate f of 4. So find a formula for f of x and then evaluate f of 4. So we want to we find the antiderivative f prime of x is equal to 2 times 3. And I'm going to rewrite this as 2 plus 3 times x to the 1 half power. f of x, our antiderivative, our antiderivative, Two, the antiderivative of that, we're going to get 2x plus 3x 1 half plus 1 over 1 half plus 1, okay? And then we can't forget our c, our constant. We clean this up, we get 2x plus 3 times x to the 3 over 2 over 3 over 2 plus c. We clean that up, 
we get 2x uh, 3 divided 3 divided by 3 over 2 is the same thing as 2 times uh, 3 divide 3 times 2 thir two thirds which gives us 2 this is 2 x to the 3 halves plus c now what we know is we know that f of 1 is equal to 3 so if i set all my x equal to 1 that's going to help me find my c value because this whole equation as we'll see in a second 2 plus 1 to the any power of any any positive power is just is just itself or any power is just 1 plus 2 plus c we get 4 plus c over here now we also know f of 1 is equal to 3 so that means 4 plus c is equal to 3 c is equal to negative 1 c is equal to negative 1 and that's perfect now we have f of x equals 2x plus 1. We know our value of c, minus 1. So if we wanted to find f of 4, if we wanted to find f of 4, we just plug it into this equation that we found here. 8, 4 to the, four to the 3 halves is the same thing as 4, the third power, the square root of that, uh, square root of 64, 8. You could, you could also put that into your calculator. 4 to the alpha y, uh, 4 to the, and I put alpha y equals to do fractions in my graphing calculator. Alpha y equals. 3 divided by 2. I see that that's 8 minus 1. Top, so 2 in the front here. 8 plus 16 minus 2. 24 minus 1. 23. And I'm not 100% sure about 10, but I'm pretty sure that it's saying k is positive initially as you, it's, it's a, for, the, for the original function, for the derivative, um, I found a negative k, so I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I post the correct solution or make sure that I confirm this if it is correct. The last part, surprisingly, was the quickest part. The, we would think that word problems and short answer are the hardest, but actually they provide the most information. Short answer and word problems are usually really good. Multiple choice can trip you up sometimes. All right? Now, if we're looking at this problem, it says suppose f is, is a differentiable function with the following table of values. We have x values, we have f of x values, and we have f prime of x values. It says let g of x equals equal f, uh, f of x over x squared. Now, if I rewrite this, g of x is equal to f of x times x to the negative 2. Um, you could also use, you could use the product or quotient rule. Um, actually, in this instance, I, act, I left it, I left it as a quotient. So let's just use the quotient rule, because that's the way that I did it. You could do, you could do either way, though. 
if I use the quotient rule, g prime of x, and, and, the, and what people do here is they start plugging in before they find the derivative. In order to do this type of problem, you need to first find the derivative before you start plugging anything in. You will get different answers if you start plugging in ahead of time. Remember. So, we get x squared squared at the bottom. We're going to take the derivative of the numerator, and we're going to leave the denominator alone. We're then going to subtract. We're going to leave the numerator alone. We're not going to take the derivative of that, but we're going to take the derivative of the denominator. And we clean this up just a little bit, x to the fourth on the bottom, and we get f prime of x minus x. Not, not a lot of cleaning up. <laughs> okay, so now g of negative 1, I want to plug that in. Well, my x value is 1. For f prime of x, my x value will also be 1. My x value is 1 here. Minus f of 1 times 2 times 1. I work this out. I get, so now I can lose the table. f prime of 1 is equal to negative 1 times 1 squared minus f of 1 is equal to 2 times 2 times 1 over 1 to the fourth which is just 1 negative 1 minus 4 over 1 negative 5 over 1 which is just negative 5 now for this you do have to show work um, for, for these problems, you will have to show work. You cannot just put, you know, you can't just say negative 5, I got it. You're going to have to show some work. Um, does it have to be um, detailed to the point like, you know, these two steps here, like if you go from here to here, that's not an issue, all right? Um, or if you go from here to, to start plug and you start plugging in, from here, that's not an issue, right? If you start plugging in from here, that's not an issue. We just need to see that the baseline that you, you understood the problem. Okay. There is not, I wouldn't say that I have a, uh, a set criteria for this problem specifically, but I would definitely want to see that you took the derivative of g of x correctly, and then I would also want to see that you, you plugged in correctly. But that's about it. Uh, for the rest of these problems, it's the same deal. h of x is equal to square root of 1 times f of x. I'm going to actually rewrite this as 1 plus f of x to the 1 half power. And when I take the derivative of this, I get 1 half times 1 plus f of x times the inside function. I'm doing the chain rule here. Now the derivative of 1 is just going to be 0 plus the derivative of f of x, f prime of x. Do not start plugging in before you take the derivative. Take the derivative first. Now that I have this information, I can find h of 2. 1 half times 1 plus, f. everywhere there's an x, I'm going to input a 2. 1 half times 1 plus f of 2 is 3 and f prime of 2 is 2 so what I end up is 1 half times 4 times 2 well these just cancel out I end up with 4 again the key steps that I want to see that that needs to be shown is you taking the derivative correctly and then inputting incorrectly. Even if you go from, you know, here to here, that's fine. Just as long as you had the derivative and from here, I would we would see that you input correctly. 
you you don't have to be you don't have to go from here to here. You don't have to just be su super explicit with your arithmetic. We want to see that you find the derivative and then that you know what you're what you're inputting in and that you're able to evaluate it correctly. Sorry. So everybody so yeah, you make everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> so negative one half. Sorry. So yeah, the e good catch, good catch, good catch, good catch. So what I didn't do was when I did my chain rule, I didn't put the power rule on it. So let's let's just let's rewrite it. Let's rewrite it. I'm gonna rewrite this as one half times one over f of two, and this whole thing, the square root of this whole thing, times f prime of two. So I went straight from this, I, I said that this is one over one plus f of two to the one half power, which is the same thing as the square root, one, times 1 over 1 plus f of 2 is 2 times before f of 2 is 2. These cancel out. 1 over 4. Oh, squ square root. <laughs> Sorry. One over, squ 1 over square root of 4, which is equal to 1 half. Sorry. So yeah, you you see how you see how vital, how easy it is to make a, a mistake and and to skip over something, or to be doing your work and and it's it's good that you put your work on paper so that you're able to backtrack. Because what I would do is if if I was diligent, if I was more diligent, at the end of my test I have extra time. I'm going back and checking through all the problems that took me a, a lot of time. Or I'm just going to go back and just quickly check as many problems as I can. Okay, because, because most times the mistakes you make aren't because you don't know what you're doing. It's just because you're not paying attention to subtle details. All right? Now, K of X is equal to 3 x plus f of x all of this squared. Oh, this is not the derivative, sorry. So I'm going to take the derivative, k prime of x, and I'm going to take my time. I'm not going to rush through this. The derivative of 3x is 3. The chain rule says derivative of the outside of the outside times derivative of the inside. Now I can just plug in 4. 2 times f of 4 times f of 4 here. We have 3 plus f of 4 is equal to 5. All right, this is equal to 5. We get 10 times f prime of 4, which is 3. Okay? Other... Another easy mistake to make, or simple mistake to make, is to go ahead and add before you multiply. Yeah, if you don't follow your order of operation, or PEMDAS is what is usually referred to as, then you will get the wrong answer. But because I know that I multiply before I add, I get 3 plus 30, which equals 33. That's another, these, all of these problems here, are, it's 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 less about you know it's it's a lot it's a lot about attention to detail a lot about attention to detail okay so this problem B was one half okay. first one was negative five okay uh, we have a word problem the dreaded word problem now we are optimizing and we want to maximize 
We want to maximize this area. It says the management of a department store has decided to enclose a rectangular area outside of the building for display purposes. One side will be formed by the external wall of the store. Two other sides will be constructed on pine boards, and the final side will be made of steel. Pine fencing costs three feet per foot, and steel fencing costs eight feet, I mean, for eight dollars per foot. I'm sorry, eight, three feet, three dollars per foot, and eight dollars per foot. Management has budgeted $960 for this project. Find the dimensions that maximize the enclosed area. So, our objective, we want to figure out A, the maximum area we can get for two sides. I'm going to call them X and Y. So I'm going to call this side X and this side Y. Just because X is horizontal and Y is vertical. It could have been, it could be the other way around. Okay. Now, what else do I know? I know that uh, the pine, oh, that's what happened. Oh, I know exactly what happened. Okay. Now, so our so now we need a constraint. Now we know that the pine is three dollars per foot. We know the steel is eight dollars per foot. All right, and we also know that. So the side of steel will be, it, 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 has a, it has a length of y. Well, our, our, we're going to say that y is, is, the, is equivalent to, you know, one, or yeah, it has, a, it has a length of y feet. So let me see, y feet, x feet. So this side will cost, the, this side of y will cost 8 times y are eight dollars per foot so it gives us a cost of eight y for this is for steel for the pine it's going to be three dollars per foot but here's the thing we have two x so times two x feet and we see how this cancels out nicely we get three Oh yeah, sorry. We get three. Or we get six. Six x, and we can leave the dollars there. So that's our cost. You know, uh, eight dollars times y, and six dollars times x. So the cost they told us, ha it has been budgeted for nine hundred and sixty. We're gonna get six x plus eight. Y equals 960. I'm gonna leave off the dollar signs because I don't I don't need them right now. Now I can constrain this. Uh, con or I'm gonna solve for this in terms of x. I'm gonna subtract 6x from both sides. 8y is equal to 960 minus 6x. Y is equal to 960 minus 6x. Oh, divided by 8 y is equal to 960 divided by 8 is 120. Let me double check. Did I do it that way? Not clear. Okay. Minus 6x over 8. y is equal to 120 minus 3 fourths x. I then take this and I'm going to plug it into my objective equation. My area is equal to x times 120 minus 3 fourths x, which equals 120x minus 3 fourths x squared. In order to maximize this, I'm going to find the derivative of this area function, which is 120 minus 2 times 3 fourths will give us 3 over 2x. And now, I'm going to set this equal to 0 to find my maximum. I get negative 3 over 2x equals 
negative 120. Uh, I'm just going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal. Okay. I get x equals 120 divided by 3 is 40 times 2 will give me 80. So this is this is uh, our distance for this for x x feet or yeah, this is our distance for x feet and then our y will be equal to 120 minus 3 fourths of x which is 80 120 minus 3 fourths of 80 is 60 y is equal to 60 and we are not done here because the question uh, it, oh yes we are we are we found we found we found the dimensions it didn't ask for the area we just found the two dimensions and we so we're done here okay we could also for good measure just find the area but we know that's 408 4800 feet squared for good measure just in case we're not sure. All right. So we're coming down, we're coming down to the end. We're getting down to the end and uh, we're getting back to critical numbers, inflection, max and minimums. Um, it says let f of x equal x to the third plus ax squared plus bx plus three, where a and b are constants such that f have an inflection point at x equals two and a critical number at x equals five. So we it's broken up into parts, and a lot of your short answer questions you will see like that. We broke it up to parts to kind of guide you. In this first part, it says use the fact that f has an inflection point at x equals 2 to determine the value of a. So an inflection point means that our second derivative is where it's equal to 0. Well, it's saying that it has an inflection point at f double prime of 2 equals 0. Right? When x is equal to 2, we have an inflection point. So I'm going to find, I got to find my second derivative. My first derivative is 3x squared plus 2ax plus b. f double prime of x is going to be equal to 6x plus 2a. All right, and how does that help me? Well, I know that f double prime of 2 is going to be equal to 6. So I can get rid of one of the variables. I can get rid of x. 12 plus 2a. So I can get rid of x, but I'm looking to find the value of a. Well, I also know that this is equal to 0. So I can set 12 plus 2a equal to 0 and solve. I get 2a equals negative 12. a is equal to negative 6. Done. So next, it says use the fact that f has a critical number at x equals 5 to determine the value of b. Now that we know a, we can find b. But f double prime of x has no b, all right? And then also, we know that it's a critical number at x equals 5, right? That can be either a maximum or minimum for us in this second part. We're going to go ahead and we're going to plug a in to this function. And so we get 3x squared minus 12x plus b. And because we know x equals 5 is where we have a critical point, 
let's just say f prime of five uh, equals zero. F. So we can say f prime of five equals three times five squared minus twelve times five plus b. We end up with uh, three times five squared is seventy-five minus sixty plus b. 15 plus b is what we get when we uh, put plug 5 into this function. But we also know that it's a critical point, so we have a maximum and min. Something's going on there. 15 plus b, we can set that equal to 0 and solve. B, when b is equal to negative 15, we have a either a maximum or minimum. Some, something's going on there. Um, but the question doesn't ask us to really go beyond that for, for part B. Part C is where we now are talking about uh, does it have a relative maximum or minimum or neither at that point. So we found B and we now are going to write our equation out as 3x squared minus 12x minus 15. We don't have to deal with so many different variables. I'm going to set this equal to 0 and I'm going to factor. Okay, so now this is already telling us what we already know. We have a critical point at x equals uh, Five and uh, we, we have a critical point at x equals uh, 5, but we also see that we have a critical point at x equals negative 1. So we didn't need, we don't need this negative 1 because it's not asking about that. So when we see f prime of x, we can just plug, we don't, we just we don't even have to do this part, but it's just good to see. We see that f prime of x is the function that we're, we're evaluating here. We're going to take a, a number on the left side and right side of 5. I'm going to use my calculator just to, just to speed things up. And I always put, I always typically myself, I put it into the graph function just so that I can take the value very quickly. I don't have to input like individual, you know, adding and subtracting. I put my function in second, calc, and I'm gonna put the value of four in. I see that if we don't care what it is, it's just positive. Our test value f of four, f prime of four is positive. And then second calc, also positive. Right now, uh, we see that it's constant. There, there is no relative maximum or minimum. And let me just make sure I input that in right. Four. Yep. So neither. So on what interval is uh, f increasing? It shows us the graph y equals f of x. Now, I see that my graph is increasing up until this point, right about here. And it's just, it's just the best approximation. I'm going to use the whole numbers that they give me. Also, right around here, which is x equals negative 1, I see it starts to increase again. And I'm just drawing arrows. Yes, I'm just drawing arrows to show me the two increasing intervals. 
this interval, negative infinity to negative 1, and this interval looks like 1, 2, 3. I'm not going to include 3. I'm not going to include the endpoints on the interval, so I use parentheses. And when I put it up here, negative infinity to negative 1, union 1, 2, 3. Okay? And so it says on which interval is f concave up? Well, I'm going to, in, in, in part D, it says sketch the graph. I'm, I'm going to start doing that a little bit ahead of time because I want to use my second derivative to help me out a little bit. In my second derivative, I mean in my first derivative, in my first derivative, we see something happening here. The slope is continuously increasing. So that means, and let me draw a line here. I see this is a max, this is a relative max, this is inflection point, this is inflection point over here, and then this is a relative minimum. All right? And this is what this is like a sharp turn. You could call it a sharp turn or cusp or whatever. Um, so right around there, I'm going to label out my graph, kind of help myself out. And then around 3. OK, so for this derivative function, all the values are positive. But here's the thing. They're becoming less and less positive, right? It's increasing, but it's coming to a stop. And it starts to decrease. It starts to decrease. So we see that there's a change. And that change occurs here as we go from positive, we go from all the values of the function are positive, but then they're now negative. Are you doing something in the third bottom? Yes. They're now negative. And we see around this midpoint is where it becomes it starts to become less negative again, and it starts to increase. Now, our function from this point on right, has all positive values where it's increasing quite fast. right? So all these values are positive and they're getting more positive up until this point right here. Right? Up until this point right here. Now, we see that all the values, they just go, it goes from being positive to like suddenly, instantaneously being negative at that point of 3. So somewhere down here, and that slope is constant because it's linear. We go from being a polynomial to a linear function. So I was able to do d first, and d is doing d first is going to now help me with question with b. So I've already done d, check. I've already done a. So it says on which interval is f concave up? Well, it's wherever the derivative function is increasing. So it will be concave up, all right? Or and on on this on this part. 0 3 We can also see the that is that it's concave up because if it's concave up that means that it can, like you could think of it as a cup. This interval here, right, would it like it would hold water, right? If you had something like that, it's concave up. It would hold, it would hold some water. Concave down wouldn't hold anything. So you could you could also look at it from the original function, but it's nice to make the comparison from the derivative graph. It makes it, it makes it very fast as well. So we've done that from 0 to 3. And our inflection point is where the concavity changes. So we also see that it's concave down on the other side. It says list the x coordinates of any points where f prime of x equals 0. So any x points where x prime of x this is either going to be a maximum or a minimum. 
we have one at x equals negative one, rel the relative maximum minimum, and we have uh, one at x equals one. Those two places are where the derivative equals zero. And we can see that on our graph. So I did this ahead of time just so that we can see. Hey, the derivative function is equal to zero right here, and it's also equal to zero right at this moment. Those are the only two places where it's equal to zero. Now, it says list any values of x where f prime of x does not exist. Three. Three because we have that sharp turn there. It's not, it's not differentiable. All right, um, and we're done. So sharp turns, cuffs, cusps, um, non-continuous functions, things like that, that those will not, uh, the derivative will not exist. It will not be differentiable. All right, we are at the, the finish line. I can see the finish line for today. There are multiple ways that you can approach these problems, uh, related rates problems. I just typically say choose the, choose the simplest way for you. Don't, don't approach it, you know, approach it the way that you, you, you are most comfortable. Now, it says an object moving along y equals x has the coordinates 5t, 5t at time t. An observer located at coordinates 70, 0, comma 0, tracks the angle between x, between the x-axis and the object's position. See the diagram. You, they were given a diagram, so you don't have to draw it out, you know, but I wouldn't bank on that. Just, just be prepared to be able to draw it out as well. But most, most times you're, you're given the diagram from what I've seen previously. It says, what is d theta, or the derivative of t with respect to uh, theta when t is equal to 6? Hint, tangent of theta. What is tangent of theta? Now, I'm going to do some labeling. This is my x. This distance here is the x. Uh, this is my y distance. And this is going to be 70 minus x, right? These, you know, the things that don't change, I want to make sure that I put them down. Now, this is my x and y coordinates as, uh, as functions of time. x is equal to 5t, and y is equal to 5t. Okay. Then I'm looking here, okay, I want to find d theta dt when t is equal to 6. What do I do? Well, I know something. I know tangent of theta is equal to, remember, TOA, uh, opposite over adjacent. Tangent of theta, tangent, okay? So opposite, y over 70 minus x. Okay, so I have that. What do I, what do, I do with that? Well, uh, we can say, I can take the inverse of tangent of both sides. I end up with theta equals tangent inverse of y over 70 minus x. And some, somebody may say, well, at this point, Am I plugging in x and y? What am I, what am, what's going on here? Not yet, okay? I wanna find the derivative with respect to time of all of this. Yes, sir. Wanna find the derivative with respect to time of all of this. So d theta dt is equal to taking the derivative of this side as well. Now, here's the thing. I have the derivative 
of tangent inverse of y over 70 minus x, uh, there's going to be some chain rule going on here. I'm going to take the derivative of the outside with respect to t times the derivative of, of the inside with respect to t. Now, the derivative of the outside, I'm going to get tangent. We already, and we did that earlier. Uh, that's going to be 1 over 1 plus. Now, this whole thing, y over 70 minus x squared times the derivative of, of these things on the inside. So I see some quotient rule about to happen, right? The so if I'm taking the derivative of this function on the top and the bottom with respect to dt, I'm going to use uh, <coughs> the quotient rule. What happens is the bottom, 70 minus x squared. On the top, I get, uh, I'm going to take the derivative with respect to t of y. So dy dt, I'm going to leave, then I'm going to multiply that times 70 minus x. I'm going to leave that alone. Minus, now I'm going to say, I'm going to leave y alone, and I'm going to multiply that times the derivative of 70 minus x with respect to t which is going to give me negative dx dt. Okay. Very important, that negative sign, um, the first time I did it, I just totally disregarded it. Okay. Now, let me clean this up. One. Okay. And I get... So with this, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna clean it up like this, and I'm gonna show you why I'm not multiplying everything out. I just wanted to get rid of that negative sign over 70 minus x squared. Okay. Now we do know some things. We do know dy dt and dx dt. If I take dx dt is going to be equal to what's the derivative the derivative with respect to t of this is just 5 the derivative dy dt is with respect uh, to time the derivative of this is just 5 so we we know that we can input those what else do we know well we know what x and y are uh, as a function of time we know a couple things. So we know that x is equal to 30 when t is 6. x is equal to 30. And we can say the thing, same thing for y. y is also equal to 30. Now we can take those things and plug them in. And d theta dt. So, so again, when t equals 6, that's, that's when we want to find uh, d theta dt. We know, our, we know dx dt uh, because we can, take, uh, we can take the derivative with respect to time of x, and five, we know x is equal to 5t. The derivative with respect to time of that is 5. Same thing for y. When we plug in uh, 6 for t, we get x equals 30, we get y equals 30. We're now going to plug that in to find our rate. So 30 over 70 minus 30, 40 times dy dt, which is 5, times 70 minus 30, 40 plus uh, 30 times 5, 150 over 40 squared. And at this point, I can keep, at this point, you don't have, you know, you, you've you already shown you know what these things are. If you wanted to go straight from this and start plugging in, 
you could, but I just like to clean things up a little bit so that I'm able to backtrack if I do something wrong. So on the bottom here, you get one plus, uh, I'll leave this alone, 30 over 40 squared times 200 plus 150, 350 over 40 squared, which is 1,600. And I think that's pretty simple enough that I wouldn't make a mistake. I hope not. I'm going to press alpha, y, enter, 1 divided by 1 plus 30 divided by 40 squared times 350 over 1600. You get dy dt, I mean d theta dt, sorry, is 7 over 50. Okay, and that is the same thing as 7 divided by 50 is 0 0.14. And it doesn't ask for uh, it doesn't ask for uh, units, but this is, you know, radians per, this is radians because your angle is in radians. I'm in radian mode in my calculator. Radians per whatever the time is. But it doesn't, ha it doesn't ask for units, and it doesn't give us the time as seconds or minutes. So, so we could just say time, or you could just put the answer. It doesn't ask us for units, so. But it's radians per whatever the time is. And that is the end. It took us a, a good amount of time. Uh, I will get, it was one problem there on the, on the second part, problem number 10. I'll make sure that it's posted. The answer key for the entire thing will be posted. So you can check it out. So be looking for that notification. Also make sure that you check. Make sure that you check.